Okay, good, good evening um, and welcome to the 27th meeting in 2017 of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. We, I would like to remind you all, please, if you've got mobile phones, to make sure they're on silent. We have received apologies this evening from Fulton McGregor, and we're welcoming uh, Liam MacArthur, your local MSP, uh, to the meeting. I'm told that I've got to make a housekeeping announcement at the outset is uh, if the fire alarms sound, there is no uh, planned rehearsals this evening. So when they sound, wait and then follow me out of the door or follow Gail out of the other door. But seriously, you're to go out of the doors and back out through the main entrance into the school. The Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee is very pleased to be in Orkney. We've had a series of meetings today and we're going to have meetings tomorrow on the Island Scotland Bill. And we're delighted to welcome those members of the public who, who have attended this evening. And I could urge you, please, to make sure that you stay till the end of the meeting, the formal part of the meeting, where we'll then move into a question and answer session. And there will be a roving microphone who will uh, move around and take any questions that you have so the committee can answer them. I think that is the end of the formal announcement, and I'd therefore like to move on to Agenda Item 1, which is on the Island Scotland Bill. This is our fourth evidence session on the Island Scotland Bill. We've already heard evidence for other local authorities affected by the bill, Argyll and Butte Council, Highland Council, North Ayrshire Council, and the Western Isles Council, and the Local Government Boundary Commission. Today, we welcome Orkney and Shetland Island Councils. From Orkney Islands, we've got Paul Maxton, the project manager for Our Islands, Our Future, James Stocken, the leader of the council, and Councillor Stephen Heddle. Uh, from Shetland, we've got Mike, sorry, Malcolm Bell, the convener, and Mark Bowden, the chief executive. Uh, we have a series of questions, and the first question is going to be, uh, question will be led by Rhoda. Thank you. Um, can I ask, given that both the councils were two of the three that originally set up Our Islands, Our Future, whether the overall intent of the bill fits with your expectations when you started that process? And could I just say, if you want to come in and answer the question, if you try and catch my eye, I'll bring you in. You don't need to push any of the buttons on your microphones. That should all happen automatically. So who would like to start off on that? James, you look like you're ready to go on that. Much. We are delighted to see the bill coming through Parliament. It's a, is it meeting all of our expectations? I would say that it's a start, but we do think that it could be much more ambitious. We think that the government could give a lot more uh, powers and opportunities for us to take things much further, and we don't want the opportunity to be missed. So we're really quite keen to engage with you at this stage to see just how far the bill can go, because I think it could truly be transformational if given the opportunity. Um, Malcolm or Mark, Malcolm, would you, would you like to, to, to answer? Yes, uh, thank you, convener. I mean, I, I agree with what James has said. I think, uh, I think it is a start, um, uh, but only a start. It could contain more. There are certainly things we would like to see developed uh, within it, uh, but I think things like the, the National Island Plan will be key, and how that plays out will certainly be key. But it's, it's very welcome. It's part of a suite of legislation which we we hope uh, is going to result in the empowerment of island communities. Okay, Stephen, I'll bring you in and then I'll ask Rader to follow up with a further question. Yeah, thanks very much. I mean, as Markham says, this is part of a, a, a jigsaw for us. Uh, we're developing the, the islands deal and we realise that the application of islands proofing to other legislation coming through and uh, such things as the uh, local governance bill and the, the, the ultimately the Crown Estate bills can be very important as well. So this is key to us, key to our aspirations of trying to gain sustainable economic development for our islands. Uh, and one, one of the ways that we're going to do that, hopefully, would be through the, the means of uh, community benefit. And that would be one of our key asks, I suppose, or one of the elements of disappointment that is not dialed into the, the island's bill as it currently stands. When the programme for government was laid, it specifically spoke about uh, additional powers for islands councils as one of the, the five bullet points for the islands bill. 
And that's not really come through in Islands Bill as it's currently framed. There's a reference to additional marine licensing powers, uh, but in the case of Shetland, it does not add anything to what they have already. In the case of Orkney, it doesn't add substantially to what we have already. So as James was saying, <coughs> the, the idea of enabling powers so that the, the things that might come up through the islands proofing process could be achieved through secondary legislation rather than through primary legislation. And we recognise that the Scottish Government might have difficulty <coughs> in uh, doing such enabling legislation. So we've moved quite a bit in the way that we've been discussing this. We started off the, the, the point of view of asking for uh, com complete implementation of the European Charter of Local Self-Government, which would be genuinely transformational for us. We've moved to considering a general power of competence. And now we've moved to the idea of enabling legislation, which would be uh, enacted in a progressive form through application to the Scottish Government to reassure the Scottish Government that they're now giving the, the islands a, a blank checkbook. So we think this is a, a not unreasonable ask. The other things that we've been looking for in the bill, uh, as I mentioned, the, the, the concept of uh, community benefit for all major uh, development in the areas. Uh, this would be, again, a transformational thing if this was understood. We recognise that major developments maybe can't come up with community benefit on day one, but when they're successful, it's, it's a not unreasonable ask. And this is one of the things that we'll be asking for through the, the devolution of the Crown Estate, that the revenues from the Crown Estate activities in our area would come back to our area to enable us to, to, to develop the economy. But if it's going to go back to the starting position when we're considering that we're campaigning to the government, they, we made the, 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 the clear ask that uh, I'm trying to find it in my notes here. <coughs> that the, in the spirit of the Montgomery uh, Commission, which viewed the development of the, the powers of the Islands Council as an evolutionary process and something that should be supported, uh, we stated up front that the Council considers that the Islands Bill should explicitly express that the Council, as presently constituted, shall continue to enjoy all sorts of special powers and legal status as, as at present and that no legislation shall be passed which derogates from the Council's powers of various its territorial jurisdiction. Now, this is an expression of the status quo. The Islands Bill is meant to be taking things uh, forward to the, the next level. So we feel that if the enabling powers is something that's too far to go into the, to this Islands Bill, that at least this expression of retention of the powers of the Islands Councils and support for community benefits should be forthcoming. Stephen, that was a very full answer. I'm going to ask Reddy to come back, if I may. Um, and just to clarify, if I also may, uh, Stephen read the issue of Crown Estate. That will come up later under further questioning, so we could perhaps part that uh, as far as everyone else is concerned at the moment. Sorry, Rhoda. Yeah. Um, does the bill as it stands have enough empowerment of island councils um, to deliver that in secondary legislation, or is there something that has to be on the face of the primary legislation, the bill as it stands, to allow those powers to come afterwards in secondary legislation. Do you think there's enough at the moment to empower you, or are you looking for something more in the primary legislation? Paul, I think you can... Yes, I mean, I, I think um, we most definitely feel that there is a need for uh, more empowerment and that primary legislation perhaps isn't sufficient in that regard. Um, there isn't sufficient flexibility. And I think you'll see from our submission that we have put forward a submission whereby we've sub suggested a, a mechanism whereby through second, secondary legislation uh, there could be flexibility. I mean, we're moving into a very uncertain and changing circumstances with, with Brexit. None of us know what the future holds. And I think it's... A, it's adaptability and having the ability to adapt to future circumstances. I think the submission we put forward, it's very much to improve outcomes and improve outcomes for our communities. It's, it's not just a power for the island's councils. The, the process would be potentially by way of application. Um, the application would be evidential support been able to show support from communities, but also uh, produce a business case. And that's very much in our interest to be able to demonstrate, not just the government, but to ourselves, 
that um, we have, um, you know, the you know the, the right case, financial or otherwise, going forward. So there's potential for a flexibility of, a, of approach. And what, what, what we're proposing is um, the potential for a, a range of competences for that application to be made under within the terms of the marine licensing provision. Um, there's scope for a, an application process um, and very much envisage something quite similar. I think um, particularly you know, going forward, how would, how would we use this? Well, potentially we could use it for fuel poverty schemes. Um, just as an example, um, we've, um, well, we've had the experience, as you'll see through uh, both the submission and in the draft constant of response, difficulties we've had um, having to rectify Scottish Government's own schemes. We would like to be proactive and actually take the initiative and go to government with, with our own ideas, our own local solutions that will benefit our communities. And I think it's very much in keeping, I think, what's proposed with what's in the Community Empowerment Bill, and in particular Section 22, which is participation requests. I think what we're basically suggesting is something following the same principle. And now, within participation requests, that allows a community body to enter into dialogue with public authorities about local issues, um, and even with the potential to take over and deliver uh, local services themselves. So I think when you look at participation requests in particular, I think there's a very similar principle involved here for what um, we're proposing here. Um, I don't think it's a case of power for power's sake. I think we have to be able to demonstrate through the process suggested that it's workable and we have local community support. Okay, before I bring in James, I'd like to just bring in John with a, with a small follow-on question to that. It's a, it's a question for Councillor Heddle. Um, you mentioned the European Charter and self-government. I, I, I wonder, could you outline the difference between what that would uh, commend and what's in this proposal? And in particular, whether, for instance, a, a single-purpose authority would be in line with the European uh, Charter and local government? Stephen, do you want to answer that, and then I'll come to you, James? It's, it's a difficult question to answer concisely, because the European Charter of Local Self-Government is a kind of large document. I mean, we've focused on, I think, with the, the Article 9 provisions in that that uh, suggests that the uh, subsidiarity should be uh, assumed, uh, effectively, the, the, uh, the general power of competence, and that should be accompanied by adequate financing for the, the local authority to, to carry out its functions. That would be the two things that I would highlight from that. Uh, the framing it in the, the terms of the European Charter or local self-government made sense in that the Scottish Government uh, has signed up to it, uh, as has the UK Government, and it would be consistent with the direction of travel for the, the, the democracies across the, the continent. James, you want to come in, you indicated, and then I see you, Malcolm, ready to go as yeah. well. Yeah, because that, that was the point I was going to make. That charter, I think, is really behind so much of what we're doing. When we look across Europe and we see the autonomy afforded to island groups right across Europe, we're, you know, light years behind them. We like, we want all the levers to make our economy work, but to make the best use of the public pound as it comes here so that you know, it gets the very best service level and also can stimulate the economy to the greatest degree. And, you know, from what, you know, the then First Minister Alex Salmon said in the Lerwick Declaration, you know, he made it quite clear that, you know, his party supported sub subsidiarity and, you know, wanted lo a local decision-making. In fact, he went on to say that the maximum degree of local decision-making should come through this. And that's really where we want to go with this. We want to see the maximum. We don't want to see this bill not work for the government or for the people or anybody in between. It's got to work so that it ticks the box for everybody. And I would almost say, with the European Charter, I would want island proofing, you know, to be looked at in, a, you know, the fact we don't have to do that. It would only be the laws or the, or the, or the things that came out of the Parliament where they said, no, you can't have a change to that. Just take it from the other perspective, 
do it the other way around, would really transform the way we operate and we would get the very best results for the community and for the nation as a whole. Welcome. Can I bring you in now? I'll answer very quickly. I mean, I think the, the short answer to the question is no, the bill, as it's written, doesn't empower. And if it was taken in isolation, it, it certainly wouldn't provide any empowerment. But I think it provides for empowerment, uh, particularly through the, um, the National Island Plan, which I think is, is absolutely critical. And we would expect to see uh, things in that that, uh, that that would help and provide for empowerment as, as, as we go forward. But as it stands, it doesn't provide for empowerment. And we wouldn't necessarily want to... to the bill to be too prescriptive in that particular respect. Thank you. Yeah. I'm going to briefly bring in Stuart and because uh, I think he's got a question and then Red, I might try and come back to you but I know there's one or two other people mm -hmm. things. S uh, Stuart. Um, I request a quickie short answer. Uh, when we visited Bursi this morning uh, one of the things we said was that the community there was also looking to be empowered from the centralised decisions that were made in Kirkwall. Is that something that's part of the aspiration of the respective councils? Who, who wants to answer that? James, you, you're going to answer that one because this, you know, we've started a new term of local government, but it is definitely our decision, and we do this already for some of our islands because we have an empowering communities a, agenda and we are actually supporting community councils on these islands in a way that has never been done before. And we are looking also to roll that out across the mainland areas so that we can take a lot of the things that councils have always done to be seen kind of as the right, the things that the communities can do for us and for themselves. And we really want to, you know, pioneer a new way because we think we'll get far better buy-in will get far better results, and as budgets get squeezed, there's different ways of doing things. Which, so totally, that is our, that, that's our modus operandi. In the same way the Scottish Government want to get powers from Westminster, we are looking to get powers from Holyrood, and we will be passing these on to our smallest communities. I'm going to let Rhoda come back with a follow-up question and, and then see where the answers. Just very quickly, if the island's plan is the vehicle, then the people deliver those aspirations you were talking about rather than the face of the bill. There is an islands plan that covers everyone. Are you talking about maybe having something individual to each area that gives the powers that you're looking for? Because I, 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 from what Stephen and James were saying, you seem to be saying that there might be something quite different that each island community was looking for. So you, so you can answer that yes or no. I mean, yes, you want your own plan for each island. Uh, the no. chapter, we want a chapter for each island because we are uniquely different and the islands that are outside the island's authorities are different too. It needs to fit the bill so it benefits everybody in the way that makes the most sense. Okay, Malcolm, Mark, do, you, do one of you want to answer that? But Mark. Thank you. Um, a national islands plan is most welcome uh, and will be enormously helpful in taking forward the aspirations of the island uh, communities of Shetland. Um, just because it's one plan, it doesn't mean that it only has to have one size fits all. The Scottish Government uh, is far more sophisticated than that. Um, there will be many things that affect all the islands of Scotland that people live on. So you could have one section that dealt with everything. Uh, and there will be some things that are unique to particular islands, or in our case, groups of islands. Uh, we see the islands plan as a, a, a splendid development because... It's not, a, it's not a once and for all. The bill is a once and for all. This has happened only once in my career. It's not going to happen again. We can't possibly deal with everything in the bill. But the plan, renewed every five years and reported on and discussed every year, will be a document whereby as you learn, you can add. As you learn, you can change. As the world changes, you can adapt. And it's a very public document. So it'll be a public dialogue between the government and the communities on the islands, which is a powerful thing in the world of politics, a powerful thing. So we're confident that we'll be able to get into that plan or at least have a public dialogue with the government about the plan that will raise the issues that are relevant and there'll be enormous pressure on all of us who sign up to things in the plan to deliver them. Um, we don't need bureaucracy around that. that will be, and then that will come in. Um, we, we talk about secondary legislation, but it, normally, it often doesn't have to be secondary legislation. What we want with the um, Crown Estate, the, sea, uh, the seabed of the Crown Estate, sorry? The seabed for the moment, okay, sorry. if you don't I was mind. just going to use that as an example. We'll, we'll, but we'll come back to it. 
we'll come back to that. Mm -hmm. I'll perhaps pick up on um, uh, Mr. Stevenson's point about um, communities and centralization. Um, centralization is not a concept we recognize in Shetland. Um, it's important to recognize the uniqueness of the three island councils and the three archipelagos they represent. They are different to everywhere else for a variety of reasons. One is the challenges that they face. In our case, the remoteness and rurality and insularity is extreme. It's a 14 hour ferry, drive, uh, ferry ride from us to our, our, the port of entry where our businesses become on the same terms as everyone else. All the costs and delay and difficulty are before that, but nobody else shares the uh, problems with isolation and rural poverty and so on and so forth. They're, they're quite distinctive. Of course, so are the benefits and the opportunities that match that. But I think one of the things I, I'd want to emphasize to the committee, if I may, is the unique position of the three island councils. Now, why do I say that? I'll use Shetland as an example because, of course, it's the one I'm most familiar with. And I have 40, pushing 40 years' experience of different councils of different types and different sizes. Uh, and I can tell you that I have never worked anywhere where the, um, the, the unity, the common identity of the community and the council is so strong. The council only serves 23,000 people. Its main settlement, Lerwick, is only 7,000 population. In, in national planning policy, it doesn't even count as town. There is no center to centralize on. We are a dispersed group of islands um, with people living in very rural circumstance and great um, homogeneity within the island. So it's a very tight community and there's a very close relationship um, between the, the, the electors and the councillors who represent them. And that means that what Scotland's got and the government and parliament have got in Shetland and in the other two island groups is is an opportunity to deliver community empowerment uh, uh, in a way they haven't got elsewhere. Because you've got an entity, the council, that has a, a huge commonality with its population and represents them really well. So it's got, a, it's got that community leadership. It's got democratic legitimacy. And it's got operational capacity. It can do things. You don't have to create vehicles that can do things. The council can do them. So I would argue that there's a superb opportunity for community empowerment in the three island groups through those councils that have the wide range of powers, the operational capacity, and the democratic legitimacy, all there ready and waiting to be used. It's a perfect time to bring in the deputy convener, Gail Ross, with the next question, because I think that, that will help focus this, this, this issue. Okay. Good evening, panel. Thank you for joining us. Um, the catalyst for this legislation came from the formation of um, Our Islands, Our Future, which was led by, as you say, the, the three island authorities in 2013. Can you tell me how well the aspirations of that campaign are reflected in the bill? You'd like to lead on that, uh, Mark? Um, very well. Very pleased with the bill. Um, it delivers on two uh, key enabling uh, pieces of legislation, island proofing and the island's plan. Um, the proofing will itself lead to a significant change uh, in the approach of national bodies uh, and indeed Scottish Parliament um, to, uh, to the islands and to fine-tuning um, legislation and policy to best suit them. And we have every uh, uh, hope and intention that the plan will lead to an ongoing dialogue whereby more and more it is delegated to the island communities uh, and the island councils who represent them as time goes by. So to re it, but, as has been said already, it's only a part of the jigsaw. It has to be taken in conjunction with things we'll come on to, um, like, uh, like the seabed. There, uh, there are many things that the forthcoming uh, bill on local government reform, the education uh, agenda that's going on at the moment, they all play in, uh, but the, the, bill is, the bill is central. Would somebody... Uh, Stephen, do you want to, to go on that? Yeah, thanks. The, as, as Mark says, the, uh, the island proofing is a, a key plank of, of what we were advocating through the Our Islands of Your campaign. And indeed, the island's plan is clearly very much to be welcomed because this could indeed be a, a, a vehicle for empowerment. 
Uh, though, going back to the empowerment issue, uh, I mean, I, I don't want to be negative about the, the, the Islands Bill at all. I think the Islands Bill is a fantastic thing. And the provisions in the Islands Bill, in terms of the Islands Plan, the, the uh, Island Proofing, and the, the, around the constituencies and marine licensing, we very much welcome that. But we're very keen that this Islands Bill is a, a thing of substance that's going to be welcomed by us by the government and by the people that we represent. And the, if you go back to the uh, initial premise for the bill, improved outcomes for uh, people in island communities, we believe that through empowerment of the local authorities and thence to the communities that we serve uh, is, is the best way to do that. And we're very much buying into the, the, the whole onward devolution thing. Uh, just as the uh, devolution shouldn't have stopped at Edinburgh, we recognise it shouldn't have stopped at Lerwick, Kirkwall or Stornoway. And uh, in the Our Islands of Future campaign, who, whose uh, work was embodied in empowering Scotland's island communities, I want to bring that into us a, a very uh, important document that we, we still go back to as, as part of our jigsaw of, of uh, making sure that everything that we, we discussed in th that process is delivered on, either through the bill or through the deal or through the, the ongoing work with the government that doesn't uh, require legislation. I mean, all, all these things are hugely important. And in Empowering Scotland's Island Communities, we recognise the, the role of the Community Planning Partnership as central to our aspirations and indeed to the, uh, the uh, disbursement of community benefit. Okay. Thanks. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, the three island authorities were the ones that led it in 2013. But we also, it, because the bill covers all inhabited islands, so we also have Highland Council, uh, North Ayrshire and Argyll and Butte. And they face their own unique challenges being part of a mainland authority as well as having inhabited islands. Um, why were they not included in the original Our Islands, Our Future? But would you want to, to, to come in on that, or would you rather...? I think they, they came in quite late in the process, and, the, if you like, the joint position statement, which had been negotiated between the three islands councils, um, was complete. An engagement had already begun. Uh, the campaign had already um, gained momentum, um, and uh, I believe that... Um, it was decision of Scottish government itself, you know, um, because that things had gone further down the line, that it should just be the three islands councils uh, that continue to be part of the process of the islands area, areas ministerial working group, although that was subsequently um, altered um, further down the line again with the island strategic group. I mean, if I may, uh, with your indulgence, uh, convener, I'd just like to make a point in respect of empowerment. Uh, the bill is, is very, very welcome. Um, we haven't had any, um, if you like, island-centric legislation um, for some 40 years. You know, it's been quite, quite some time. It's very, very welcome. Um, however, there is no additionality when it comes to empowerment. Um, it was one of the key questions of the consultation. Indeed, you know, what additional powers do you think are necessary? And from recollection, I believe it was 73% um, of those who responded confirmed that there should be additional powers uh, with, within the bill. Now, I think in the absence of you know, further empowerment, um, and that's leaving aside marine licensing because that was a separate question about the extension of powers within the local acts. When you look solely in isolation at additionality, there isn't really any additionality unless you look at the National Islands Plan, which in a sense is could be described as empowerment, um, but it places a huge importance on that National Islands Plan. And you'll see from the Orton Islands Council's response that we do have a wee, some concerns there. Um, I think it's absolutely imperative that the, the Council um, has a, you know, a very large say. And the same for the other five authorities, indeed. And again, going back to what was said before, you know, each area, each authority 
has unique circumstances for their area. So it's, again, imperative that that's um, manifested within, within that plan. And, you know, I think it could be stronger. There's um, one of the recommendations from Orkney Islands Council is that, you know, the council, along with its um, community planning partners, sh should be a statutory consultee. I mean, I, th I think that's reasonable. Um, and I, th I think that specific provision could be stronger. Okay. I'm going I'm to bring Liam in, if I may, and then I'm going to come to you, Malcolm. Thanks, Stephen. I, I don't know whether it's cutting across what others were saying. It was picking up what um, Stephen Heddle was saying there about island proofing. I think one of the messages we've heard through previous evidence sessions, and I've certainly picked up locally, is that um, there are high expectations for this bill. Um, I'm not sure necessarily um, there is a, 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 a wide awareness of the enabling nature of the legislation and therefore certainly in terms of island proofing it's about legislation to come, about policy to come rather than um, the retrospective application to, to problems that are already there due to what might be construed as a one size fits all and I was interested that in the Orkney Islands Council submission you make specific reference to that at one point in um, it's disappointing that there is no distinct mechanism to deal with retrospective island proofing. The Council gave numerous examples in its consultative response where um, its islands have suffered detriment through failure to island proof legislation and that becomes a, a recommendation in response to the first question of the consultation. I was just wondering um, whether you had any firm views about how that might be achieved, whether it be through the island plan or whether it be through a commitment from the government to look at some of those specific examples um, and, and retrospectively apply the island proof to give some confidence about what island proofing might mean in future. Can, can I just say at this stage that we, we have got a separate uh, topic area on island proofing where, where Liam, I think that question will, will absolutely focus people's mind on it. So if I, if, rather than put that completely to one side, could I just plant, put that one on hold on the moment, offer Malcolm the chance to come in, and then I would like to move on to the next topic. I am very mindful that we have quite a few themes. The first theme that we've tackled has taken half an hour, and, and the committee would like to hear from the audience, um, and, and I'd ha hate for them to be sat here thinking that they're not going to get in before 11 o'clock. So we're going to have to speed it up just a wee bit. So, Malcolm, if I could bring you in and then move on to the, to the next panel. And, Liam, I'm going to bring your question in at, at, the, at the moment where I see it comes in. So, Malcolm, if I can go Thank you, Convener. I mean, I'll be brief, and I just want to go back to the, to the Deputy Convener's question, uh, which was around uh, island authorities and authorities with islands, I think, the, the, the difference. And I think if we look back to the, to the beginning of the campaign, it was, it was born... Uh, in the very early days of, of the independence referendum campaign when a very tight constitutional situation, because constitutions tend to be frozen, they're not easy to change, um, slackened off or, or thawed a little. Uh, and that gave us an opportunity. And we saw an opportunity. We make no apology for seeing an opportunity and seizing an opportunity. Uh, and it seemed, I mean, it made perfect sense uh, to work together with uh, our fellow island authority partners whom we have so much in common there's lots of differences but we have so much in common as well uh, and, and also very different from other authorities who have islands I mean we provide services for 100% of the people we provide services for rather are islanders I think if you look at um, Highland it's something like 5% so we're very very different from them but we were always very clear uh, that any benefits that came or fell from the campaign uh, would apply equally to islands uh, across Scotland. But in the, the initial stages, uh, it was clear that the three island groups uh, would, would, work, um, would work together. Okay. I think we're going to move on, uh, James. Uh, to one thing, that's okay. Don't dilute the island bill to try and make it a one-size-fits-all because that's, it must maximise for, for, for the people that initiated it. I'm, I'm giving the impression from what, what people say you want it stronger, not diluted. But, but uh, John, I think yours is the next, next question. Yes, our next theme, I think uh, John Finney and myself are both asking some questions on it, is the National Islands Plan. I realise we have already touched on that uh, to some extent. So I've just got really a couple of specific questions. I was, I mean, I was interested, I was, I, I really enjoyed reading the whole Orkney submission. And uh, so I picked out one of two things. And, and specifically on the Islands Plan, you say that it was discussed in the Island Strategic Group 
and the comparison was made with the Gaelic language plan, and you felt that was quite a good model. So I just wonder, if, could you expand on that? Because I'm not that familiar with the Gaelic language plan, I assume, I assume a few others aren't either, as to what was good about that that you would like to see replicated here. James. It was definite commitments, both sides, and holds to account, and that's what we really want to see in, uh, in, in that, so that we have definite commitments from the government, but, but also th things from ourselves and timescales on them in which they, they would be delivered. That's essential so that things don't drag on for years. I, I also use words like proportionate, uh, if, I, if I've got that, I think that was correct, um, that, uh, which I took to mean that in different areas of Scotland, Gaelic has a different significance yes. and therefore councils would treat it differently. And so I'm assuming that means with the Islands Bill, um, because every council is different, um, even the three island authorities, that uh, you would, um, you'd want that kind of flexibility built in somewhere, either into the plan or into the bill? Assumptions are correct. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting very short answers. Uh, okay. Um, well, my second... Please congratulate. <laughs> <Yes, thank you. laughs> uh, my second point, then, uh, would be... It has been suggested by some people, and as a lay person, as a city person, I confess, um, I'd wondered if there should be some kind of, uh, you know, sp specific objective, overarching objective in the bill. I mean, the one that came to my mind was say, to stabilise and strengthen the population in every island in Scotland, or so, something, you know, kind of that would really, I would have thought would apply to yourselves, <laughs> to the Western Isles, to, to other islands. Um, do you think there's a need for that? Or, I mean, the government's feeling seems to be it's better to leave anything like that for the plan, because that might change. But I would have thought, again, some objectives would be permanent, you know, for the next hundred years. James, do you want to come on that? Or? Yeah, yeah I, I could just finish that off because I think if you look at each uh, you know, community planning partnership in each of the islands, that would actually say that. And I, I just thought that that would be a given in what we do. So we're strengthening, we're actually sustaining islands. We're hoping that they have a more active role in the life of the nation. And we secure each and every one because some are particularly vulnerable and need you know, support from authorities or from the councils that look after them. I'm going to bring Malcolm in and then Stephen. Malcolm. Thanks, Kevin. No, I've actually got, I mean, James has said really what I was going to say. I've got nothing much more to add on, on that. I mean, we, we would expect, I mean, we don't want to see, I think I've said earlier, we don't want to see the bill prescriptive. I mean, some of the things uh, Mr. Mason talks about would clearly be desirable outcomes in, in, in any event. Uh, but I think the plan uh, needs, to, needs to be built on, uh, needs to be renewed uh, regularly every you know, num number of years, needs to be reported on annually and needs to be clear and outcome uh, focused uh, and, and something that's easily uh, measurable as, as, as well. But we certainly wouldn't want to see it prescribed within the, within the bill itself. Words into your mouth, but could you just clarify that for me? You don't believe that um, keeping that there needs to be a description of what the bill's trying to achieve on the bill, that it can be covered in the plan. Is, is, is that what you're saying? Well, that, or do you think there should be an overarching description, which I think is what John was suggesting should be in the bill? I think, as James said, I mean, what, the, the, the things that Mr Mason talked about is part, part of the day job. It's what, what we do uh, every day. And, and I think the plan needs to be as, as flexible uh, as possible to meet changing uh, and ongoing needs. OK, I'm going to bring Stephen and then Mark in. Yeah, thanks. I mean, the, the, the bill necessarily should have high-level aspirations. So if it was going to have an objective, it would need to be a high-level objective. I mean, as framed, it says improving outcomes for the Scotland's island communities. And I think that's something that we could support. The point that you made around uh, retaining population uh, is obviously linked to, to jobs and opportunity as well. I mean, I don't think that's a, a high-level aspiration any of us would uh, disagree with if it was to, to, to come forward. But certainly, uh, bear in mind that they introduced this as a question on, on the plan – 
the plan itself is clearly going to be very important for bringing in the, the detailed and specific uh, objectives that is uh, <coughs> coming forward from the, the, the local authorities. And I notice in previous evidence sessions the word co-production was used a lot. Uh, we would certainly agree with that, the, the, that the island's plan should be something that is co-produced yeah, between exactly. the local authorities yeah. and the, the, the Scottish Government. And that, yes, there should be specific chapters uh, based on each uh, local authority area and indeed uh, perhaps within each local authority area for the, 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 the specific smaller groupings. Okay, Mark, and then I'd like to, get to move to John, if I may, Mark. I, I do understand why uh, people, particularly uh, people who aren't lawyers, um, might have the aspiration for something rather more specific. Um, but but it, it does have an objective, as Stephen has said, which is improving outcomes. Mm -hmm. I think that's a good phrase. Um, I think it would be very difficult to become more specific without leaving things out. And whatever's left out can't be done. So people will use its absence as a reason to say, well, you can't put that in. Um, so go, becoming specific, I think, is very dangerous in terms of the section on the plan, especially as it's going to last for many, many years. And we can't predict now um, what, what will be coming up in five or ten years' time. The other thing is when, when you become specific, you tend to focus on the negative. You tend to focus on correcting what's going wrong, correcting islands with very small populations where the whole community is fragile and what you might want to do about it, preserve and growing, whatever it is. And you tend to miss out the aspirational positive stuff. There are huge opportunities in, in our island communities to um, contribute not just to the well-being of the islands, but to the well-being of Scotland, to extract enormous social and economic benefit. And that tends to get missed out when you put in specific objectives because you tend to go with correcting the current ills rather than grasping that future. Okay, that, that's a very helpful answer. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to... John, if I may. Thank you, Convener. Um, any piece of legislation, the committee scrutinising it, gets lobbied to put specific... Uh, information on the face of the bill. Now, we know that, for instance, transport, the digital infrastructure, access to health and social care and education are going to be addressed in the plan. Should they be specifically mentioned in the bill, though? Who would like to, to go on that? You, I noticed one or two people put their heads down when normally they, they'd been quite happy to put their heads up. Uh, Mark, your head is still up. Would you like to...? <laughs> the of making eye contact. Yes, the... Um, <laughs> um, it would do no harm to put in um, specific um, instructions from Parliament to the government to do certain things for us. Uh, please feel free. Um, um, as, long as, as, as long as it wasn't only that mm -hmm. which was required. Yes. There uh, was access to health and social care. Now, we've already seen um, the integration take place. If I come back to the phrase I tried earlier, single purpose authority, and I got no biters first time round, could you comment on that, please? Does that fit in with that general philosophy of, you know? Say, absolutely, we would love to investigate that because we joined our, you know, our, our Council of Social Services or with the Health Board way before Integrated Joint Board became a government prescription. And since it became a government prescription, it's held us back because it's put another layer of governance in that and, a, and, and an effort for us, whereas before we were doing it, and we'd love the opportunity to be, as we are in energy and any, many other things, a real microcosm test bed, a proving place for things that you know, could be applied elsewhere in the country. And we do think that the single purpose authority, as we would call it, because we don't want to miss out the third sector from that, because we believe they're important here we could do something quite transformational for our people and make sure that every pound note that comes into the community gets used to its best effect to provide better services. Mm -hmm. Sure, we'll pick up on it. it can, can I talk about consultation? And, and it would probably just a brief answer because you have alluded to it. And that's the level of consultation you would anticipate on the development of the island's plan, how you'd go about that. And I'll just bolt another one on quickly then, convener, and that is the time frame for, is it realistic, the government talking about uh, um, being laid before the Scottish Parliament with a year of the, the Act coming into force? Is that realistic? 
M Mark, you, you signified you'd like to give an answer to an earlier question, so maybe you could slip it in with the answer to this one as well. Thank you. Um, I think a year is yes. We, 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 mustn't, we mustn't accept bureaucratic slowness, must we? We must get on with things. Um, and, it, and if we get on with it, it's more than long enough. The islands, obviously we would want the islands authorities and the key uh, industry and public and voluntary sector groupings to be consulted directly by the government, but we'd be there with our already well-established uh, systems of consulting with the communities in our island group to, 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 to be used to do that by the government. So it, should, it shouldn't be a problem. Going back, if I may, to the, um, to the earlier um, question, the answer is yes. It, it, the, the agenda of a single public authority fits really well with this. And I think there are, there are two reasons. One is that as public services develop in the way they are developing, not just in Scotland, but in other places as well, where you have a geographically remote area, there starts to become big disadvantages as you um, go for economies of scale uh, and things start to become remote and start to move to Aberdeen and you know, what have you. Um, uh, but there is, a sc there is scope for economies of scale through merging different public functions in the island group. Um, and it fits really well with autonomy. So if we look at some of the most successful island groups in Europe, which are a benefit not just to themselves, but to the nations they are part of, Holland and Faroe are leap to my mind. I mean, Faroe is a very successful place, very good place to live, um, very content population, and draws virtually nothing from the Dan Danish uh, public sector spend. Really successful. Holland, um, the same. And I'm familiar um, with a very successful council um, in uh, a rural Finnish Lapland. Small population, uh, 50,000, and it does everything a Scottish uh, unitary would do, plus secondary health, plus water, plus sewerage, plus, 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 and works really well. So it's an ideal solution for the more remote, the more sparsely populated. I'm very, very just going to push uh, somebody from Orkney to answer the question, can the island plan be drawn up in a year? Paul indicated, I, I don't know, it, it could be a simple answer. Sir, the answer is yes, un, un, unequivocally. I think uh, it's that important uh, to us that certainly the, you know, the, the input from Orkney, the commitment um, as demonstrated through the Our Islands, Our Future campaign, indeed with all three islands councils, I wouldn't hesitate in saying certainly from our perspective that that's achievable. Obviously, it's dependent on other, other parties, but the commitment would be 100% from, I'm sure, from the three islands councils. You're saying yes, and uh, Stephen's holding his hand up. I don't know if that's to say no. Uh, I, I think there's no say, dissent. I yes, uh, so John may have had his question answered, so uh, if you can keep whatever you're going to say quite brief. Uh, yeah, I'll keep, keep it quite brief. I think there's two, kind of two questions being asked there. There's the, 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 the question, can we consult in time? The answer to that is unequivocally yes, because we have a good relationship with the third sector who do consult, consultation exercises for us. We have a very good community planning partnership whose uh, <laughs> consultation guidelines we use, and we have, we're uh, energetic and empowered community councils uh, and we'll be establishing 20 new county councils, uh, community councils, sorry, in, in short order. The other part of the question is, do we have ideas for the plan? Uh, and the answer to that is unequivocally yes as well. Malcolm Burr, I think, made the, the, the offer, which we would echo, but we could go away and write it for you if you want. <laughs> we, we have plenty of ideas that we could put into it. So it's a, very much a yes to that. I would want you to write their part of the plan, but I, I'm sure. We're going to move on. John, if you're happy with those answers. Uh, I'd like to move on to uh, the next section, which Mike's going to start off with, and Liam, it's going to incorporate the question you had. So, Mike, would you Thanks. like to start that, please? Thanks, Convener. I, I want to drill down into the specifics of island proofing, because this has proved a little bit problematic in the evidence sessions that we've had so far, formal and informal. Part three of the bill places a duty on Scottish ministers, and about in the annex of the bill, about 60 different public authorities, they're all listed, uh, including the councils, of course, to have regard to island communities in exercising their functions, so to have regard to. Now, the issue that we've been wrestling with is exactly what does this island proofing actually mean? How do you do it? We want to avoid a situation where somebody in Glasgow, Edinburgh, anywhere else, out with the islands, sits down in an organisation like Scottish Water, just, just to give an example, and, um, oh, we've got an initiative, 
I've got to think about Orkney or Shetland and great, I've, I've thought about that and I've ticked the box there because I've island proofed it. How, what, what, what does island proofing actually mean and how best do we go about it? Do we need to in, consult people who actually live on the islands, for instance? Uh, I'm going to start with Mark and then come to James, if I may. Um, I think we do need to, in thinking about this, draw a distinction between Ireland's proofing in section or clause 7 and impacts assessments in the later clauses. And I'm only talking about clause 7. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's an attitude of mind. If you, if you imagine that you're a civil servant in a department or a government agency coming up with a, some idea for improving whatever, you think about communities in Scotland and how it might help. All you have to do is have in your mind that there is a variety of communities in Scotland and at one extreme of the spectrum are the three island groups and the remote, in the case of Shetland, the most remote northern area with their particular issues and just have that in your mind. It's not complicated. And the, the, the fail-safe that makes it a simple process is communication. Just speak at an early stage in devel developing your policy with the relevant organisation, with the relevant, in our case, the council, the relevant island, and say, this is what we're thinking of doing. Does that sound sensible to you? Not a complicated process. But what you're saying is that whoever's in charge of that organisation initiative needs to speak, either yes. go there or speak to people who live on the I'll, islands. I'll give, you, I'll give you an example from recently, which was Skills Development Scotland, who came out later in the day than was ideal, but not too late, with a proposal for changing the funding of um, uh, modern apprenticeship training, not where the people lived. You'd have to go to it. And they changed the funding of travel in such a way that meant that nobody from Shetland would ever take part in a modern apprenticeship, ever. We picked up the phone. I had a chat with the chief executive. Other people chatted, and it was changed, and the appropriate cost was put back there. Payments were put back in, problem goes away, dealt with. It wasn't complicated because they published before it was too late, before it was cast in stone, their proposals. And the initiative's on us as well. We've got to keep our eyes open what's going on and say to people, excuse me a sec, you're proposing that, well, hold on. And it wasn't, it wasn't a difficulty in that case. Stronger because all it says in the bill, we, we have had to interrogate the Scottish Government's bill, that's what, we've got, that's what we're doing, to try and improve it yeah. if we can. And so... Do you think that have regard to, that simple phrase, is strong enough? Yes, I do, because we would want to do this by dialogue and partnership working as we do with all the agencies and the government. But the bottom line is, I'm not afraid of judicial review. If you can't prove to me you have sufficient regard to the particular circumstances of Shetland, well, off we go. Sure. Mark, I, I'm concerned. You've, that's yeah. twice you've mentioned legal matters. Yeah. It must pick up from your background. Can I, I'm, I'm concerned to go to... to James, to, can I bring you in, yeah, if yeah. I may? The last thing we want is judicial review. I think we can co-produce things and work you know, forward from the beginning. And if we have major pieces of primary legislation, we would want to have a really good chance to engage with them. Secondary legislation, there's another thing where people identify or where we identify knowledge of what's coming through. But there's a lot of ministerial discretion. And this is one of the things that we have the biggest problem with, is where people could make a change for us, but they don't have the confidence to do it. I think if we set this properly in place, people will have far more confidence to help us with the small things that may be an irritant to some, but they're absolutely fundamental to our life in other ways. For instance, you know, the heaps abs that came through the Scottish Government before the money came to our council and we had really good outcomes. It came through in a far more prescribed way more recently that we didn't have the people trained here. So we missed the first £1.4 million of benefit to the place with the greatest degree of fuel poverty in the country because we had to tick all these boxes that were inappropriate and really only really devised for things probably in the central belt or further away. And at that same time, the, the public money wasn't being spent to the best use. So we want to make sure that if this comes through Parliament, that everybody is aware there's opportunities to do things differently in Ireland at every level. 
Just if I may make one... Just well, before comment. you do, if I may, can I, I, I rather rudely part Liam's question from earlier, and, 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 and I think if I don't bring him back in, it, he, he, he may make my life difficult. So, Liam, would you like to bring, bring your question back in, and, and then, Mark, I'll bring you in, and I know some other people queuing. I, think, I, I, I know you're on my home turf, but I think you overstate my powers in these parts. <laughs> um, I, I think what I was trying to draw out for the panel, and particularly from the, the Orkney delegation, was the point around demonstrating what island proofing might be by applying it to cases in the past. And I think just picking up uh, Mark's suggestion there around um, apprenticeships, I think I'd like to hear from the panel um, a description of some of those um, areas where um, legislation has been to the, to the detriment or policy being to the detriment of the islands that doesn't necessarily require additional resources to be spent. Because I think that the risk, the example Mark uh, put, um, posited there, a very good one, is that it will play to the notion that simply this is about putting in additional resources in order to island-proof policy when actually I think very often, and there are examples certainly in the, in the Orkney submission here, that suggest it's not about additional resources, it's about tailoring the, the legislation or the policy so that actually what you get is a better fit, um, a better delivery of the public, object, the public policy objectives for no more and potentially even less resource than is being spent at the moment. Would that be a fair characterisation and can oh, you help me out with a few examples? M Malcolm, you... you were nodding. Do, could you give us some examples? And maybe I could come to each of you and, and ask for a limited <laughs> example, please. I'd probably give, give, give many, but I mean, I, what I would like to say is I mean, we, we deliver public services on the edge, I mean, on, on the edge of the UK geographically as, as well as in terms of sustainability. Um, and it's probably never good to, to define something by a negative, but what um, Island proofing is not about advantaging uh, or giving advantage to the islands. It's about not applying uh, disadvantage uh, 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 to the islands uh, and things that are, are detrimental uh, to us and, and things that could be quite easily, and Liam's quite, quite correct, um, sometimes it's very easy. Sometimes it doesn't require spending a lot of money. In fact, very often it will save money if this is put in uh, in the building blocks uh, right at the very beginning. And I mean, uh, j just another example of informal um, uh, island proofing was, was quite, quite recently the, the island's heads of planning were involved in the very early stages of uh, a national uh, review of Scottish planning policy, which resulted in um, uh, fl the flexibility being built in f for the island situation. I, I don't think that probably cost a penny to do, but it, but it certainly it probably saved a, a lot of grief and a lot of, a lot of money in the, uh, moving forward. So. Mark, Mark, do you want to give an example? Or, okay, um, or? Oh, I've got a whole list here and I'll restrain no, no, myself. No, no, but, no, no. But, I, but I, I want to come example. back, if I could briefly, uh, a further point on um, Mr. Rumble's point. Um, let's have a detailed amendment then that will make it slightly better. If you turn to Clause 9B, my suggestion to strengthen uh, having regard to would be to delete the words that authority considers uh, and insert R. So there's a specific suggestion for a drafting change. Okay. James. The, uh, oh, you're going to give yes, me now the example. The example. Yes, <laughs> the, um, one I'd point to that's re a recent one that's very good is um, the island screening assessment carried out by the Minister for Social Security on the, uh, the implications of the new bill, and particularly, which led to no extra cost for anybody, um, and particularly picked up on the issues of fuel poverty and disability assistance issues in the islands, and will in due course at the next level lead to a specific addressing of cold weather payments because of the difference in the way the weather and so on and so forth works in the islands. It didn't cost anything, and it was really, really good. On the other hand, one I would like to mention to this audience, because you are the guilty party, um, is the failure um, to sufficiently island-proof the recent requirement for qualifications for head teachers in a way that is seriously putting, going to put at risk small island communities with small schools in the future. We are very, very worried about what, what has happened. Um, and that would have cost nothing to have island-proofed that properly. James. I think you asked for retrospective, so I'm going to go a long way back to Scottish housing policy. 
And if our real intent of this bill is to retain our own population and things, I've got no problem with the system whereby different categories of people get different awarding schemes. And I've got no problem with the movement of people across the country. But if you've got people on a small island and that island need isn't met first in housing policy, you can have the crazy situation where people from an island need to move to another island or mainland Scotland to get a house. And I think that's really true at the moment with the situation we hear about right now in Arran. And young people particularly need to be able to know that they're going to get a house in their own area. So I think we need to just, some of these things could be island-proofed in a way that gave a much better result than you could ever imagine. Stephen, do you want to, to give an example? <clears throat> yes, thanks. Uh, I th in the interest of brevity, I'll refer to our consultative response, which goes into some detail on, on lots of issues. But, I mean, things like early years, self-directed support, the bedroom tax has been mentioned previously. These things give us problems. Recycling uh, and the affordable warmth, the, the lack of support for green electricity gives us problems. And, indeed, if we're going to look at the ferries plan, we, we supplied uh, a, a chapter and some verse as well for the, the ferries plan, but didn't get incorporated in it, and that's causing us problems uh, now as well. But if I could also go back to, to Mr. Rumble's question about the, the pay regard to. I mean, clearly there's a, a, a spectrum by which you can pay regard to things. And the exists and already in the, the policy memorandum that accompanies bills, the, there's meant to be consideration of islands. That's clearly not working for us. What we're moving to, to with, with the suggestion of the, the impact assessments is something more akin to an equalities issue. And we can see that equalities considerations works. So this gives us more confidence. But the question is, to, do you need to consult with the, the, the islands' communities? Yes, you probably do. Co-production is the word here again, and the, the, the island's councils, as to the democratic representatives of the communities, uh, would like to be consulted uh, in the, the first instance. And I would like to make sure the, the, the point that there's no really a distinction between councils and communities in our areas, as you might find in the, 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 the larger authorities. We're a, a community of 20,000 people, and uh, I would say the, the council is by no means distant from its community. Uh, and anybody can accompany me to the supermarket and just experience how close we are to the community and its representations yes. at any time. Yeah. Paul, are you, are you happy that sufficient examples are given, or would you like... Uh, uh, in fairness, I'll give you the opportunity to give one, <laughs> if you want. Thank you, uh, convener. Yeah, I mean, this, this very building we're, we're seated in, today is an example and is referred to within the submission where by current building regulations most carbon most carbon efficient way of heating um, these buildings according to the standard method used for energy modeling buildings to achieve regular regulatory compliance is to install LPG as a secondary heat source now the, the council um, not just with this building, but with the Kirkwall, uh, Stromness Primary School and the Halls of Residence, we're, we're having to import all this LPG at a great cost for no apparent reason. We've given quite a number of um, cases under the, the building regulations and understand that um, building regulations is um, something which is subject to review by, by Scottish Government. But I'd just like to make one point. Forgive me if I'm preempting you here when, if, when I talk about the importance of guidance. Am I, am I allowed to speak about that? Or importance. Guidance, the, the guidance for... We are covering it. Um, so maybe we could come back to that. Absolutely. Yeah. Can, I, can I just say your point about, about uh, gas has already been made and picked up by the committee on, on one of the places we went to today? And, and the fact that you can be disadvantaged for using renewable energy, which we saw being generated uh, this morning. And, and I don't think there's a single member of this committee who somewhere doesn't have a little green tint to their eye when they look at this lovely building and the facilities that are here. I think uh, it's something to be extremely proud of. So if I can move on to Jamie, which is uh, the next question. Thank you, Convener. Uh, good evening, panel. Um, I, th I think it's an appropriate time probably to talk about uh, the island impact assessments at this stage uh, to 
uh, developed the concept of island proofing, so-called island proofing. Um, the bill as it stands uh, will affect 66 public authorities, which includes everyone from Scottish ministers at one level to NHS Orkney, uh, a very local authority at another, and everything in the middle, including national bodies, uh, which govern all of Scotland. The bill as it stands requires them to consider uh, and develop an impact assessment to um, any development, delivery or redevelopment of any policy, strategy or service. It's quite wide-ranging. My question is, is, what happens if, after that impact assessment, it has been identified that such policy change or change to a service or change to a strategy has identified a potential negative effect on island communities? The bill thereafter only states you have to report that you've produced an impact assessment. There's no reference to what happens next. So how would you uh, deal with that scenario where you had done an island impact assessment or a body listed had done an assessment which has uh, produced this negative, potential negative outcome? There's no, for example, finance in this bill to, uh, to mitigate those negative effects of those policy decisions. So what are your views on, on the impact assessments and how, it might, how, how you might deal with them? <coughs> Who'd like to leave? Uh, Paul on that. Paul. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's no provision within the bill for any form of review of any impact assessment. And I think, you know, that, that is a failing. I think there has to be something. Um, I don't think we want um, a very cumbersome process. We don't want something which is necessarily going to be, um, you know, working intensive, but I think there has to be something there. I mean, there's always the fail-safe uh, position which Mark has uh, referred to, judicial review. None, none, nobody wants to go down that route, but I think by the same token, we need, we need a, a fair process of review which is transparent. Um, at present, there's no um, provision within the bill for uh, any publication of uh, impact assessments. Um, you'll see from Orkney Isles Council's submission that we've stated that you know these should be published, and I, mean, I don't think there's there's any problem with that. Um, it's it's fairly routine in these these kind of uh, governmental things where we, we talk about transparency n nowadays. But um, just what. I've, I've thought quite long and hard about what what would be um, a proportionate um, way of reviewing decisions, but I, I haven't come up with anything myself just yet. There's various examples I don't doubt that the bill manager will potentially look at, but I do feel there has to be something. Well, I'm definitely going to let you in because I'm fearing a judicial review if I don't. Have you got it? Do you have an answer? The, um, uh, we need to draw a distinction between the have regard to provision, where as long as whoever it is can show they've had regard to, that's sufficient, and it will be very public. So that's good. And then when we come on to the impact assessments, we do have to be careful not to create an expensive bureaucratic process here that's going to slow everything down. They need to be proportionate which is why when we come on to talk about the guidance, that would be quite Im important. But I think we also need to um, have in the back of our mind that this is not about anybody telling the decision-making bodies, particularly the government, what to do. The decision will still rest with, as, it, uh, as determined by Parliament, with whoever it rests with. The point of the impact assessment is to, um, is to oblige them to consider... Uh, the, um, as in clause 12, subclause 3, the likely effects in the island areas, and if there are particular effects, to describe how they might be overcome or not. Because it's got to be proportionate. You, you can't put everything right every time. And as long as it's open, and it is... Re um, as, uh, the, my reading of it, would, would the, 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 uh, the impact assessments published under 12.3 would be public, as long as the decision-making body can show, yes, we thought about this, yes, we identified this, and this is what we're going to do, that's fine because that's an open process. The political process will take place. There'll be a public debate. 
uh, and so on and so forth. And I suppose one of the things that's underlying what I'm saying is we're not seeking equality because that's impossible. Um, what we're seeking is equity, that it's reasonable and people have thought about things and can articulate that they've taken it into account. So from my perspective, um, Clause 12.3 is fine. James, do you want, Jeremy, do you want to come I, I, back? I, I, I appreciate your, your view on that. Um, it, it's fair to say in much of the evidence we've taken, perhaps not from local authorities, but from other stakeholders down to community level uh, and even down to individual level, uh, their fear really is very much that impact assessments and island proofing as a concept will just be a tick box <coughs> exercise. And if that report produces uh, a potential negative outcome, uh, there's no real meat on the bone in the bill that, that anything will change. It's just an identification of a negative p potential outcome. And it's there for down to the authority to decide to do whether to do anything about that or not. It's quite possible there may be a financial implication to rectify that negative outcome, and that will require funding from whichever source. And this bill is not backed up in any way with any financial promises, assistance, support. Uh, you know, how, how do you feel about uh, those organisations um, not being able to, uh, to mitigate the negative effect of their policy decisions? Um, the citizens of the islands involved are as important as the citizens of anywhere else, and there doesn't need to be separate funding or separate consideration for them. They should be thought about, and any legislation or policy decisions um, should have regard to their, the quality of their life and their future as much as any other citizens. So I don't think anything, any special... James, do you want to add to that? Well, I think we have to operate on a de degree of trust, but at the same time, by doing that, if the things are clearly identified, you know, people won't be able to stand in the way of the really important issues that need to be changed. Okay, I'm probably going to move on to the next question, if I may, to, to Mike. I think you've got the next question. Um. Well, it was covered earlier on, actually. Okay, um, so, so maybe I'll go to Stuart, if I may. Uh, if, uh, thank you very much, Camilla. Um, let me say I take a slightly different view to my colleague, Jamie. I think uh, the impact assessment might also identify positive outcomes as well as negative. But there might be a negative aspect to identifying a positive outcome in the sense that somewhere that's remote but not an island, and I just choose Campbelltown, might be better informed at how they are disadvantaged by a positive outcome for Ireland. Now, that's a comment. I'll move on to, uh, to uh, but I think there's a big issue in there that we need to think about, perhaps. Um, uh, Mark uh, said on several occasions, have regard, and I recognize it's been said, and Malcolm Bell said not disadvantage. Now, the outcomes we're going to get to some extent in the island proofing are going to be determined by ministerial guidance. How light touch should the ministerial guidance be? Indeed, should there be any at all? And in particular, should it be very flexible to allow different authorities, there's a large number of them, to perhaps develop their own and publish their own ideas as to how they will implement it so that they can do so in the context of their responsibilities rather than it being a centrally directed one. Now, that's a very big question, but it might be a short answer. Who would like to go with Malcolm? Would you like to start with that? Just very briefly, I think, I think the guidance does need to be clear, it needs to be concise, and I think it needs to, to it's important it sets out very clearly the process uh, to, to be followed. Uh, and sorry, you uh, in, the, in the sense that I think some of the thrust of the evidence that we've heard this evening is that a process that works in Mulgai will not necessarily work in Millport. So I'm going to challenge you. Do you really want one process to apply throughout the system and in all circumstances? Is that actually what you're trying to say to us? Well, I think, yeah, Mark, sorry, sorry, Mark, Kavira, I think, I, I think it's possible to, to set out the, the outcomes and the, the, the standards you expect. I mean, the, the, the detail of the process may well vary, but I think the, the, the standards could be the same anywhere. I mean, I think that, I think, I think. So, so we, want, we want 
to work to the same standard, but we want to work to a process that's appropriate to the context. Is that a fair Absolutely. representation of what you're saying? Thank you. Thank you. Others? Stephen, I'll bring you in, and then I'd, I would like to go back to, to, to Mike to ask a, a, a little point on detail, if I may. Stephen. <coughs> I just want to get this chance to say co-production again, because I think if co-production is uh, used here, that will ensure a, a degree of standard uh, <coughs> led by the, the local authorities engaging in this. Uh, I'd also like to uh, touch on the, the, the point you, you made us a, a comment about the, the, the what about Campbellton. I think when we set out on this campaign, we were always very clear that the, whilst we may be kind of pathfinders for islands in general, we would be delighted for the, the, the benefits of what we were doing to apply to other islands, and indeed that's what's happened. But I think that any <laughs> adverse issues for rural communities that we might identify as island groups. I, I don't think the government would go and wantonly prejudice the, the rural community uh, whilst uh, giving us an advantageous situation. Mm -hmm. So equally, I, I think that the, in supporting the, the islands through the islands bill, rural communities are going to benefit to a substantial uh, amount as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Mike, can you? Yeah. Um, I appreciate we're speaking to the Orkney Islands and the, and the Shetland Islands here, but when we were on Mull, um, people that gave us informal evidence certainly um, felt that it wasn't just the councils that needed to be consulted on island proofing, but you need to go further down the line. Um, it wouldn't be sufficient for the people on the island of Mull for our Guy Island Bridge Council to be the consultee. But similarly so in your island groups, should we not just make sure that when we're island proofing that we don't just consult the councils, but also go further than that and consult people living on the individual islands. That is, that is effective. Paul, Paul, you are nodding. Do you want to, to come in on that? Absolutely. You know, I think you, you would have to. I mean, just in the same way that if um, Orkney Islands Council was um, looking at any of its policies, it would, you know, or even considering anything, you know, in the process of island proofing, it would consult with community planning partners and uh, its community groups. And I think this all goes back to the guidance and how important the guidance is. And the present uh, Minister for the Islands and Transport, Umza Yusuf, has certainly made very strong and vocal um, representations to the effect that he anticipates um, the island strategic group, which has this, the six islands authorities um, take part in, uh, will, will have an important part to play, you know, in the production of that guidance. And, uh, you know, the, you'll see from the submission there's, there's a number of things which Orton Islands Council has certainly put forward as distinct issues which we feel should um, be incorporated within uh, that guidance. Um, you know, the uh, Articles 174 and 170 of the Lisbon Treaty. I mean, when, when we say that, we're not talking about seeking to transpose European legislation into the guidance. What we're talking about is looking at the principles themselves and just bringing them basically... Because, you know, why reinvent the wheel? There's a ten the template there to a certain degree there are principles which have been established at a very high level which can you know be referred to when you know that, that guidance is is drawn up um now i see both stephen and james want to come in i'm afraid i'm only going to let one of you in um who, who, who will it be will it be stephen yeah, uh, I think that the uh, democratic mandate of the uh, local authority and indeed the community councils shouldn't be missed out here and that the, the, the consultation with other communities of interest, other islands, should be done through the, community, the, the local authority and the community council because, let's face it, the, the bill has the duty upon the local authority to pay regard to island communities. So this is something that should happen anyway. Mm -hmm. So there's a kind of logical cascade through there. I want to come in very briefly. Yeah, I, very briefly the, the, certainly for, for Shetland's concern, there's no other body uh, on the island that has the democratic legitimacy that the council has. I mean, quite clearly, we would... We would um, uh, consult further on. I mean, even uh, 
even community councillors. I don't think there's a single community councillor in Shetland who has been elected in a competitive election. So I think the, 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 the council undoubtedly has a, a democratic mandate in order to, to, to carry out this, this consultation. Sorry, James, I'm not going to let you know. I'm going to move on very briefly, if I may, to the next section before uh, I come to Richard, who's got the next set of questions. Just for completeness, I'm going to say uh, the Scotland Act 1988, o Orkney and Shetland, were fixed as two of the 73 uh, constituencies for the Scottish Parliament. For some reason, the Western Isles was ignored. I, I am assuming that you absolutely believe that they should be part and have the same protections as you. And if you're going to say no, um, uh, I'm not ready for that. So <laughs> we're taking the answer as yes. Um, uh, uh, we're all agreed? Y yes. Okay, I'm going to move on to uh, the next section, which is Rich, Rich Thank Lund. you, Convener. Uh, Mark said earlier that he was 40 years in local government. Very boringly, I was a councillor from 1976 to 2012 in Lanarkshire, a sum of 36 years, and then moved on to the Scottish Parliament. So I think I'm beating you by a year, uh, or a number of years. Anyway, uh, you'll remember the many boundary changes, uh, as I do. 2004 brought in the three or four member wards. That means that populated islands must be placed in an electoral ward, which also contains a significant uh, proportion, often the majority, of mainland uh, population. I know Orton and Shetland, you know, it slightly doesn't affect you, but it does, uh, I would suggest. So this has led to concerns that distinct interests of uh, island communities may not be fully represented in council discussions. The bill proposes to make an exception to the rule for local government electoral wards to allow areas with inhabited islands to return one or two members instead of the three or four. What do you think in regards to those proposals? Who'd like to go with that? Mark, you're off. Um, not, uh, we are not the only people proposing this, but they are very much our proposals. Um, we see the reason for three and four member wards, not, not got a problem with that. Um, we don't think that there needs to be any change to um, uh, uh, the uh, equality of representation, and we don't think there needs to be any change to rules about who can stand as a candidate or anything like that. It's a very simple proposal. And in our case, the most obvious example is we've got one war. Oh, and we've got lots of islands that are part of mainland, as in the Shetland's mainland, um, and, and they'll have to be because they're too small to, and they're too far from anywhere else. But we've got one ward, which uh, we, we call the Northern Isles, but actually it's a three-member ward, and the two northernmost islands, uh, sorry, the three northernmost islands, Yell, Unst, and Fetler, could justify two on their own. The Eastern Islands, uh, uh, Walsey and Skerry, could justify one on their own. Now, in the last council, we had a councillor on Unst who represented, um, with his colleagues, Skerries. There was no councillor living on Skerries. To go to an evening meeting in Skerries, he had to drive to the ferry, take the ferry to Yell, drive across Yell, take the ferry, ferry to mainland, drive across mainland, take the ferry to Skerries or Walsey, and then try and get home again. Well, it didn't happen. Um, so we want the ability just to split that because they do justify a councillor of their own and geography would make it so much easier for the councillor to represent them. So, that, so we're very supportive of that. Okay, do, does somebody, uh, is it a problem in, on Orkney? Or? It's not something we've discussed really yet, even as a council. We're interested in the concept. We weren't very keen on moving to the situation we've got at present, but we do have a better representation for our islands by the number of councillors that represent because we've got, we've got six island councillors from people outside the mainland, which is quite a strong lobby. Uh, so we, want to, we would need to think about this very carefully, but we're very keen that we don't have a one-size-fits-all or forced to go in those directions without really good consideration of the situation. So basic, basically you would have uh, consultation with your local uh, areas, local councillors, you know, in the very point that you've made, Mark, is, is you know, the, somebody who stays away up there, down there. My view is that someone who's representing an island should stay in an island or, or should be, you know, in, in the thing rather than, a, you know, and, there, and uh, yes, there, there won't be one size will fit all, but 
both all the councils who are affected by this would stand and consult and also be happy that the number of their councillors, because in Lanarkshire we went up seven, seven councillors from 70 to 77 uh, in North Lanarkshire, uh, and I was opposed to that. Um, but basically in the islands, if we went up a number of councillors, you'd be quite happy? Overall, well, number, be happy, number. Mr. Chair, we'd be happy with the principle that it was possible, but at the moment we don't have a particular need for that because the, with, with the ability to, to have one and two rather than three and four, the current ratio would work for us. But if it didn't work, the principle of being able to do it would be a good one. Okay, uh, Jamie wants to come in and then we'll move on to the next section. Thank, thank you. It's just a brief follow up on that. I, I think one of the pieces of feedback we got was that uh, you're looking for flexibility. Um, and that what works on Orkney may not work in Shetland, but what works in Shetland may not work on Iron and the mainland there. So uh, would you agree or disagree with the, the, the concept of that this bill should provide you, uh, empower you, the ability to have more flexibility in how you structure your councils? Yes, uh, Malcolm. You, you could argue maybe should have gone further and, and allowed five member wards and... and some cases, I mean, there might be some, you know, some way of uh, where, where that would have been a fix. But uh, absolutely, the, the, the principle is welcomed. I agree with Mark. It uh, will have limited um, uh, benefit to Shetland, uh, apart from the, the example that, that, that he gave. But it's good to have the flexibility. James. Yeah, the system of multi-member wards was was de devised for party politics. And I don't know what would happen if party politics became more a thing on the islands. It isn't particularly at the moment, and I don't know how that would work. But I think for us to have the opportunity to explore and see how best to get representation uh, is, you know, I think that would be for a discussion for a future date. But leave us with as wide opportunity as we can, and I think the local solution will come through. Okay, before I move to Stephen, I, I think John's got a point he'd like to ask about. This morning, concerns expressed about powers being given to the councils because they don't know what independent councillors stand for, and there was, quote, no accountability. Can you comment on that? Oh, Mark. A constitutional lawyer, um, the accountability of e every councillor, however elected, is through the ballot box and direct to their electors. <laughs> um, but, uh, th there is the question of... Um, you know, a direction of travel. They will say, certainly with party politics, regardless of what that is, people will know a broad slate of issues. H how is that addressed? Because it was a genuine concern that was expressed by a number of people this morning. Sorry, we can't hear the gentleman. Sorry. Two more. Hold on, hold on, two seconds. Yeah, we're having sound issues. Yeah. So, am I okay? do I need to repeat that? Or is that Would you yeah. Mind? yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I think the answer is, is, is very, very much up to the electorate. If the electorate wants a party political council, we must obviously the position that Orkney is in. Um, <coughs> party pol politics has never really taken off in local government. Um, and when it has been attempted, uh, invariably, almost invariably, um, it's the independence that, that went through. So clearly, the electorate wants to have an independent council. Whatever, you know, warts and all of that's their, their view of it, but that's what they, that's what they vote. Um, I'll let James in, and, and then perhaps we can move on to the next one. And I know, uh, Stephen, you, you are going to feature in the next line of questioning, so James, uh, come in. Yeah, we have an election every five years. People go door to door, every house, no, no, no one is not touched by the process that we go through, and with our mostly independent council, what I would say is every division in the chamber that I've been in for the last 14 years has reflected the real sense of our community. So if there's a very tight vote, you know perfectly well the community is very tight, and I think it's really reflective, and I think it's truly representational, because when you take the amalgamation of the 21 of us with different views, you get a very clear position of where the community is, and I think that's been really useful, and that's why I think we can be of use to the government to do something different. 
Well, John. Th yes, thank you for that. It would be passing strange that issue having been raised this morning if we didn't in turn raise it with yourselves. You'll understand that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, right, the next section, uh, Peter, I think you're leading on that. And uh, I just put uh, Stephen on warning that you may be the first one in here. Yes, good evening, gentlemen. Uh, I'm going to speak about, uh, ask you a wee bit about marine development, and you were obviously very keen to get involved in that earlier on. But first of all, I would like to say that I've been impressed by your great enthusiasm for the bill. The, the, whole, the whole panel has, has shown a great enthusiasm and great vision as to how this bill could make a difference to your, to your communities. And I'm impressed with that. And I, I, you know, I, I need to say that right up, first up. But the, the, the question, the marine development thing, the, the bill provides a regulation making power for the Scottish Minister to establish a marine licensing scheme for development activities within the Scottish Island Marine Area. Now, there, there are some differences here because already Orkney and Shetland have many of these uh, powers already. So I assume you agree that, the, that this regulation-making power is, is, is something that you wish to continue with. But my, my main question is, what is your experience of this marine development power yeah, and what can you give to, 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 to uh, expand the learning experience to other areas that don't already have that? Stephen, you don't yeah. have to go first, but if you'd like to go <laughs> first, because you mentioned well, it earlier, I will, of course, let you in. I mean, I, I think that the, both Orkney and Shetland would say that it's a very, very positive experience that, that we have and one that's benefited our communities. We've managed to, uh, through the, the marine licensing, the works licensing powers we've had, to manage sustainable development of uh, potentially controversial activities, oil ports, and do it in a way that's <laughs> maintained the environment and benefited our economies over a period of more than 40 years. So it's a very positive experience and one that I would commend to the, the, the rest of uh, Scotland. I think that the, the Islands Councils do have a demonstrable expertise that could be, be shared. We have a very sophisticated harbour operation that uh, monitors the, the waters around our islands 24-7 uh, and in the past I've always joked that uh, we have our, our navy in the form of our, our tugs and our ferries. We have our early warning system and we also have an air force because we operate the, the internal air service here as well. So <laughs> they can, we're more like a, a small state than, the, than, 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 than most, most local authorities. Uh, so, in terms of the, what, what would it mean to us, the, the, the provisions in the bill? Well, I mean, we have the, the, the powers over our harbour area, which is Scarpa Flow and the, the Kirkwell Bay area. And we would like to enjoy that power over the, the, the distance out to the 12 mile limit. Uh, so uh, it would mean it would be an incremental move for us, but it would certainly fit very well with the idea of uh, an integrated process for developers coming forward to us if we controlled the, the marine licensing over the, the, the Orkney Islands area and indeed controlled the, the revenues and management powers of the Crown Estate over that area as well so that the consenting, licensing and planning process could be done through a, effectively a one-stop shop with the local authority. Um, Paul, and then I'd like to go to Mark, if I may, please. Yeah, I, mean, I think, um, you know, so far as experience goes, I mean, when um, the aquaculture Scottish Government were looking to transfer aquaculture um, over to the, the planning system, they um, engaged with certainly our council, Orton Islands Council, extensively about our knowledge of works licences and how to transfer those responsibilities over to aquaculture. So I think there's, there's quite a pedigree there, and I think that pedigree is acknowledged indeed through um, the engagement we've had to date with Marine Scotland and now Crown Estate Scotland in respect of um, looking for the further devolution you know, of, of the, the marine environment and in particular at the moment um, with respect to, to pilot schemes. Um, we had a very um, good engagement recently with Crown Estate Scotland with a view to moving pilot schemes forward. Um, I think, you know, it's, it's, it's just joining everything up, you know, when you look at the big picture. I and mean, I think, as, as Steve, Stephen said earlier, it's, it's all about 
um, max maximising efficiency and making making the the consent process a, a one stop shop. Um, and I think the pilot scheme, certainly in respect to the Crown Estate, will give us further experience in, in that regard and indeed help um, Scottish Government um, potentially with the, the framing of the, the Crown Estate legislation. Um, I mean, Sorry, Peter, you, do you want to... Is there an expectation that the new powers under the new bill will be different from what you have already? You, you mentioned... I'm not sure how far out your, your, your uh, powers go at the moment. Uh, the proposal is to go to 12 nautical miles. Is that what you have at the moment? Or is, the, or is this going to increase the power that you um, have over the control of the seabed? Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm happy to answer that, if you like. Yeah, well, Shetland does have that. Out to the, to the edge, but Orkney's limit was just a bit in Kirkwell Bay and partly Scapa Flow. We need to make sure that we go out to the full extent of that and actually do something... And, you know, in the same way that we would like, in some respects, that SNH was moved, you know, to Inverness, if there's a chance for the Crown Estate to be moved to the periphery, I think there'd be a better result for all of us. And, you know, if we have expertise in that, we would be keen to share it with other coastal areas. Sorry, do, do, Mark, do you want to come in there? Um, there's a particular answer and then there's a general answer and the general answer goes to the heart of what we're talking about tonight. The particular answer is that the Zetland County Council Act has been an enormous success for Shetland and we'll stick with it. We, we, we don't need the powers that are in, in the bill because they, they are based on Zetland County Council Act. Um, there is one tiny amendment we'd suggest which is around a clause 19.3 C and D where we think as well as um, saying that um, uh, uh, grants that predate the um, new legislation, a variation of grants that predate the new legislation should be allowed to survive as well. But that's a small matter that can be dealt with in paperwork. The, the Zetland County Council Act has been um, central to the good management of the marine environment in Shetland in the face of substantial exploitation for oil and gas and fishing and aquaculture, all of which pose risks as well as benefits. It's been central to them delivering those benefits and the economic benefit of all of them for Shetland. It's been a huge success. And it's been very straightforward for the council to implement. There has been no problem in implementing it. It's well within the capacity of a of primary authority, any council in Scotland, uh, to deliver that sort of thing. So it's great. The more general answer is that this is just the start. And now we come back again to the island's plan that's in the legislation. Um, we, will, we will want to explore in coming years, in a way we couldn't go firm on today, well, we could in terms of the Crown Estate, that we want, two things are running here. For the island authorities, the, island, the archipelagos that are just islands, the sea is what it is. is it. We're not about land. We're about sea. Our wealth and our economy and our communities based on the sea. So it's vital for the uh, benefit of the community, the benefit of Scotland, and the proper exploitation, that that authority with the capacity that's focused on the sea has as much power and autonomy as possible on the sea and the seabed to extract the maximum benefit with the greatest security around environmental sustainability. So we are going to start with the Crown Estate. We want management of the Crown Estate mm -hmm. in our area. But it's not going to stop there. There's a duplication with Marine Scotland. We want delegation of that so that we can deliver a one-stop shop to developers and industry in, in, in exploiting um, the sea. We've got a very successful shellfish management scheme that's not replicated elsewhere. It's a good example of what you can do, and we want to do more of that. And without going into great detail now, if I just tell you that our vision is FARO and research what control they have over fishing, and we may well go there in years to come. Okay, just before I move to Liam, if I, I can just clarify something, and then I'll probably come back to Peter if I may in a minute. Is, is my, my question to you is, uh, obviously, with, with uh, taking all the income from the Crown Estate, I, I, I'm, I don't have a view on that. Will, will come the liabilities that go with it as well. Uh, and the question that some people have posed is whether some of the smaller islands 
not necessarily you, uh, would, would have the ability to carry out the enforcement and the licensing required with, in some cases, quite minimal income. So it appears that one size doesn't fit all. So my, my question to you, my first question to you is, would you agree that one size doesn't fit all, and how would you make sure the bill reflects the needs of the other islands around Scotland when it comes to the Crown Estate? Mark, do you want to start Just on that? To start off, these sorts of things should be a power, not a duty. People for whom it is appropriate and useful to take on that level of autonomy should be empowered to do so, but they, it shouldn't, the duties and responsibilities where they outweigh the benefit and the practicality should not be forced on them. Okay, so that was my first question, and rather like a, a, a question that was raised earlier this evening, one of the issues that we had put in front of ourselves uh, today, I think uh, one of the meetings was the issue with the, that planning at the moment feels remote from the fishermen who are actually trying to operate and, and make, make it work. Would you, do you think you'd be in a position if aquaculture was superimposed upon fishing, which may be very coastal, um, it, would, it wouldn't have a negative, sorry, that's a double negative. There would be no impact of, of that aquaculture on local fishermen and the trade they're carrying out. The, Mark, Mark, do you want the, to go with the, that? If we're talking about town and country planning, then that's already done. I think they were suggesting that, that, that marine development ah. uh, and, and also aquaculture may impede what they're trying to do around the coast w when they're fishing as well. Ab absolutely right. And that's why we, will, we want a one-stop shop based in, in our case, Shetland, where we know there was a proposal um, uh, recently for the siting of offshore, uh, a, a potential site uh, for, for offshore wind generation that was right slap bang on top of the best, best fishing ground west of Shetland. We knew that. Um, we would never have proposed that site because we're in, you know, we wouldn't even need to ask the fishermen that, but of course we would. Um, so we think that the one-stop shop locally, with the local knowledge and the intimate connection with um, local bodies, we work very, very closely with the Fishermen's Association and the Shellfish Association. Um, we're ideally suited to avoid that sort of inadvertent conflict. Okay, I'm going to bring Liam in before I let James come in. Liam, you want to... Oh, maybe, thanks, Camille. I'll maybe tee James up. I, mean, I think with, with characteristic um, warmth of hospitality, James threw in the offer of, of hosting Crown Estate Scotland, which had me thinking um, not so long ago there were concerns around um, where uh, Wave Energy Scotland was going to be sited, uh, and disappointingly um, it didn't have... Um, a, a real presence in, in Orkney, notwithstanding Orkney's lead in wave energy. Do you think within this bill there needs to go hand in hand, not just where decision powers uh, rest, but actually some form of um, relocation policy uh, for civil service jobs as well, which we haven't really seen uh, over the last number of years? Y yes, I would say certainly. I mean, when it came to the social services stuff, I would love to have seen a cohort of these jobs go to the Western Isles because I think that really fits well. We don't always want to divide everything up a third and a third and a third among. We want to do the thing that's right for each local community. When it comes to, we've been speaking about the, the marine planning, marine and terrestrial planning must join up somewhere. I don't think for a local area it joins up in Edinburgh. I think it joins up in the local area so that all all the engagement with all the stakeholders can come. And we've just really recently with the Pinton Firth and Orkney Waters, a joint project with Highland Council and Orkney, that not only won a Scottish planning award, but won a national planning award, because we are really quite far ahead in some of these things. And for us to, to drop the ball at this stage would be unforgivable. We must make sure that we, we bring that ashore so that, so that we actually get you know, something happening locally in these areas. And we've got to also watch with the Crown Estate where the revenues go, because the revenues must follow the activity. If it doesn't follow the activity, it becomes a farce, because it could be a disbenefit to a community if they don't get the revenue for the, for the energy and work they put in to making sure. And, you know, the seabed and the marine is our future. There's an awful lot around here, and we've got to make sure that we capture the, ben the full benefits from these things. 
I'm going I'm to bring Peter back in, and then I, I'd like to get a brief answer to his question and then move on to that. Well, it's, it's just a, it's, it's more a statement, really. I mean, you're obviously very enthusiastic for these powers, and you obviously want more powers than, the, than is proposed in the bill. You want powers over aquaculture, which isn't in the bill, and the Crown estate money as well. So uh, it's, it's more a statement, actually, just to say that, that you, you, you're very enthusiastic, but you would like it to go much further. So Steve, Stephen can come in on that, and then we're going to move on to the next <laughs> section, because yeah, I, I am mindful of the audience, and I would like to get them involved as well. I would certainly uh, emphasise what enthusiasm. I think as a, as a panel, we're enthusiastic and passionate about the, the, the whole subject here, and, and keen to see the ions in power. But you, you mentioned the Crown Estate revenues is something that we're wanting, uh, as if it was not something that we haven't been promised already. We would say that the, this is something that we have spoken about and negotiated at length with the Scottish Government through the whole empowerment and Scotland's Island Communities process, and I would refer to pages 37 and 38 in that uh, uh, August document, <coughs> as, uh, where it speaks about the, the central role of the, the local authorities in uh, as, as, uh, the managers and the uh, disbursers of community benefit in their areas, and the Crown Estate revenues as an adjunct to that process explicitly being the, the revenues that's accrued in the, the area for each local authority. Okay. I think we're going to leave, leave that point there and move on to the, the, the final questions, which are from John. Uh, thanks, convener. And uh, last but not least, uh, finances, which are something dear to my heart. Um, we've, we've already cl clarified, obviously, that this bill does not deal with where would the money come from for a new school or a new hospital or a new ferry. Uh, but where the finances are relevant is more around the administrative side of things. And we have the financial memorandum, which mentions various figures. And I, I saw in Shetland's a submission that you were wondering if £5,000 was sufficient for a, the annual progress update, a, which would be something that the Scottish a, government is doing. And I also wondered, another figure that jumped out at me was the £30,000, which is, says the local authority would, each local authority would a, incur um, because of um, consultation representing the island communities and so on. So I just wonder if you have any comments either on these two figures or on the financial memorandum generally. Uh, James, and then I'm going to come to Malcolm. Yeah, it's one of the things I'm really quite interested in because people look at the costs, but they don't look at the other side of what the government would get back. Because if you invest in the periphery, the amount of tax take and VAT receipt that the government gets as it goes from pocket to purse all the way back to the centre is far greater than investing elsewhere. So I just want to make sure that people get that in their understanding. Investing in a strong periphery of the country is really securing the centre and it's actually bringing, bringing revenue back. So these figures, I would suggest, are triflingly small in relation to what this benefit could come from this. Yeah, I mean, just to clarify where, I, where the committee is coming from and I'm coming from, to happy to accept that point that they're triflingly small. The question is, is sh should they be bigger? Is it realistic for the government to expect uh, your council to do all that work for £30,000? I mean, that's really... Oh, well, I, I, I mean, I, I thank you very much for giving us that opportunity and allowing us back in, uh, John, because, yeah, we, we, we have uh, we're already expended a lot of money on the Islands of Future campaign. We have joined with the, the other two island authorities and we put in a joint pot of money on more than one occasion, because we believe this is so important to our future, that our commitment to this, I think you can see, is wholehearted. But we do think that, you know, for the value that's here, and if there was any way to support this further from the centre, what I'm really saying is, I think you get the value back in, sp in spades. Thanks, Malcolm. Malcolm. Thank you. Thank you. In terms of... Um, value. I think Shetland already is a net contributor to the public purse uh, in, in, in the UK. But I, mean, I think their comments around the £5,000 uh, was, was more to do with giving it just sufficient uh, promotion. Um, I mean, we, we think generally the, the, the memorandum is, is, is pretty reasonable. But I think we, we felt £5,000 in terms of giving it sufficient drive and focus was probably just a bit on the low side. In terms of the, 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 the 30000 that's something that we already spend as part of the day job anyways and as one of our budget lines uh, in terms of the consultation that we already do carry out. 
Uh, I'm just going to come to Jamie for a final small question, but when I do that, I'm going to ask James and Malcolm um, just if there is a key fact that we have not got across during the course of this evening, if you'd like to drill down on it now with, you, with your team and just be ready to give us a key fact at the end. So I'm going to ask Jamie to ask his question. Um, it's, it's actually very, very relevant to what the convener has asked you to do. I, I, I'm quite keen to hear, um, and it, it can be very brief, if there's one thing you could change about this bill, you know, now is your time to, to get it out there. What would you change about this bill in its current form? I okay. find that immensely helpful. So, Jamie, I think I, uh, my question are the same. Is there something you'd change, something you'd add? Uh, so, who'd like to, to go on that? James? Well, just, I mean, we, we covered it at the beginning. What's the enabling powers? We want them to be absolutely secure, absolutely, it's fundamental to, to the benefit of the bill for us. The second thing is the status of the the island groups as in permanence so that the bill actually means that they are there in perpetuity. Really important for us. And the fact that we can do something for community benefit to really enable our communities to excel and be more than they are today. And if we have these three things enshrined in the bill, I think the bill will work for us. Okay. Um, Malcolm, to be entirely fair, I must give you the opportunity to mention three things and not just the one that I suggested. <laughs> so, Malcolm, do mention three things, if you like. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're generally happy with, with, with the bill, uh, I think, as we've already uh, stated. I think if we were to add something to it, just to answer the question directly, I think it uh, would be, um, I, th I think that we would wish to be a, a statutory consultee uh, to, the, um, to the National Island Plan. Uh, and uh, also, uh, I think we ought to be consulted uh, on the guidelines uh, that, that are forthcoming. So that, that would be the, the, the two major uh, okay. the, the, the must-haves that we would like to see in it. Okay. Um, that really concludes Agenda Item 1. And what we, we have to do as a committee is agree something formally prior to our next meeting, which we're going to do straight away. Um, and then I'm going to conclude... Uh, the meeting as a whole and then go to questions and answers uh, from the audience and I'll explain how that's going to work but uh, first of all I'd like to thank the, the, the panel for coming and it, it is quite clear that you are um, you know completely committed to, to achieving the best you can f from this and thank you very much so I'm going to move very much for coming also it's a joy to have you and it's you know this is really useful for us well that's very kind of you to say that um, we're enjoying our trip that's what that much is for sure so I'd like to move on briefly to agenda item two which is a decision on taking business in private the Scottish government's asked the committee for a comment on parliamentary timescales for scrutiny of the future government's uh, draft climate change plans. It's proposed that the committee will consider its response to the government in private at its next meeting on the 4th of October. Uh, that's this when, when Wednesday. Are members of the committee agreed? agreed? Okay, that's agreed, and that therefore concludes the formal committee business, and I'd now like to close the meeting.